that he is alive and that we can come and celebrate that fact that Jesus is alive and so many of you this morning know that firsthand that Jesus is alive you've encountered him and he is your Lord and Savior as he is my Lord and Savior um, just bear with me just for a moment this was not supposed to have switched off there we go <laughs> but this morning we are going to talk about that resurrection and what the resurrection means to you and I and that you and I can encounter this Jesus. Perhaps some of you this morning are here um, because it's tradition that you go to church on, a, on Easter Sunday, but it's more than that. Now, I haven't seen some of you for some time and some of you have been sick and it's just so wonderful to see some of you here this morning and what Christ has done in your lives and that He has been faithful and that He is so good to us. And this morning... As we're going through the book of John, it just happens that we just right in the place in our year study of the book of John, actually over a year, where we find ourselves recognizing the fact that Jesus is truly alive with us. And so this morning I want to talk to you again as we talk about this epic journey. It's the 62nd message in the series. And you think, wow, that's a pretty long series. But as we go through that, it is the Word of God. And so this morning um, we, we want to talk about this aspect of our hope is in a whom. Our hope is in a whom. It's not in something else, but our hope is in a whom. And I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Once you have found the passage, or you found it on your Kindle, or whatever it might be, or whatever means you have, let's stand as we read God's Word together. I'm reading from the Pew Bible, it's the New Living Translation, John chapter 20. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they've taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. Peter and the other disciple started out and they were both running. But one, of the other the one other disciple outran Peter, and he reached the tomb first. He stopped, and he looked in, and he saw linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside, and he noticed the linen wrappings lying there. While the cloth had, been covered, had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed, for until... Then they, they still hadn't understood what the scriptures had said, that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. Mary was standing on the outside of the tomb and crying. As, as she wept, she, she stooped down and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they've taken away my Lord, she replied. And I don't know where they've put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought that he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will go get him. Mary, Jesus said. And she turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which means teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But go find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to the Father, and your Father to my God and, and, and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. Then she gave them his message. Just so far, you may be seated. You ever have noticed um, that life has a way of killing dreams? When we traverse this life and we go through life, it's almost some of our dreams get crushed and, and they get destroyed. We set out with high hopes and perhaps in school we thought this is my career, this is what I want to do. We have high hopes for our schooling, for our careers. We even have high hopes for our family. And then we have high hopes for the golden years when we retire. We have plans, we have aspirations, we have expectations. All of these things are part and parcel of our lives. And suddenly the life that you're living, you come to realize doesn't always turn out just the way that you dreamed it may, it may have. Or you find yourself in a place 
where you've never really expected to be. You find yourself in a dire situation. This message and parts of this has been adapted from a very good friend. And as I read this passage, how many of you have seen the show La Miserables? Uh, probably many of you. And maybe some of you have seen the movie when it came out just recently. But the story goes there was a young woman whose name was Fantine. And she was, she was written about by Victor Hugo in, the, in, this, in, this, in this wonderful show called La Miserables. And as we find what was going on and, and, and as we viewed this and we would see the show, our hearts were touched and, and we were taken through different areas of our lives. And we were moved with emotion and music and, and drama. And as we were looking at that show, we find that Fantine finds herself in a very hopeless place, in a place of dire need. Her summer lover had left her alone with a child. She finds work in a factory, but has no place for her daughter, Cosette. And in keeping with some of the cruel, crooked um, people that were working with her, they found that out and then literally fired her, threw her out. And when it was discovered that she was with child out of wedlock, it was even worse. She was thrown out of the factory to live a life in the streets as a beggar. She was forced to sell her hair and then to her teeth and then her body in order to pay for Cassette's care. What a dire situation. She was falsely accused of a crime and placed under arrest. And on top of that, she became desperately ill. And out of that dark place, she sings this song. And these are the lyrics. I dreamed a dream in days gone by. Now life has killed the dream I dreamed. Can you relate to that? Perhaps you've had a dream. And that dream has been killed. Hopefully none of us would find ourselves in the situation that Cosette found herself in. And that Fantine found herself in. We all have found ourselves in places that we've never expected to be. We've always found ourselves in dire situations. Perhaps things have crept upon us and we've never realized. Things don't always turn out the way that you expected. They have a habit of doing that. And we know how it feels to be disappointed, to be discouraged. And we know how we've, it feels to when all hope seems dashed and all hope is gone. If it's not true of you right now, perhaps you know of someone who's going through that very situation right now. And they need you to come alongside them and to be there to encourage them. Maybe someone you love, someone that's close to you. I know it seems strange that we start an Easter sermon on, a, on such a doomy, gloomy kind of note. And yet when I find that, it's not about Easter bunnies and it's not about the chocolate and it's not about Easter egg hunts. And that may be part of Easter and a part of our tradition and celebration. But that's not what Easter is all about. That's not what the resurrection is all about. But the resurrection is about a new day. It's not about the new clothes. It's about a new lease on life. It's something brand new that Jesus Christ gives to us. And this, the celebration that we have today, is where it begins. It begins at the grave of our Savior with a woman weeping crying our heart out. And let's begin our journey there this morning. As we see this dark place, it's early in the morning. But yet, as the sun rises, and as we experience this morning, it leads us to a brighter place, to a happier place, as we think about what Jesus has done for us. You see, the Gospel of John offers us great details and gives us details maybe that some of the other Gospels don't give us. John teaches us how to live in the light in light of what happened, in the light of Jesus Christ. And remember how we read that Mary had already made one trip to, from the tomb that morning. She went and she saw uh, that Jesus wasn't there. She ran back to the disciples and she called them and they came running to the tomb. And when she and the other woman had found it empty, I wonder what was going through their mind. Surely they've stolen the Lord's body. What's happening? She went back and there Peter and John were. And they ran back to the tomb as fast as they could just to discover that what Mary had said was actually true, that the tomb really was empty. There were the clothes, the grave clothes of Christ. And Mary followed them back again. But by the time she reached the tomb, the two disciples that had outrun her and were already peered in, they'd already taken off 
And they've probably gone back to where the other disciples were. And that left Mary all alone, standing at the tomb. At there, at where the rock had been moved away. I wonder what she was going through. And I wonder why if, if, if the emotions and the turmoil that was going in her life. Everything that she hoped for, everything that she saw in, in, in Jesus had now been dashed. She cried at the grave. As so many of us do when we stand around a fresh grave. The emotions grab a hold of us and we weep. And our hearts are broken. And yet, there we see Mary of Magdala crying. Weeping. There's so much speculation about who Mary was. Some say that she was the prostitute that we read about in Luke chapter 7. The one who anointed Jesus with her tears. There are some theories but none of these can really be substantiated if that was really the Mary that we read in this passage. All we are told that it was Mary of Magdala. But she was one of the women who became a follower of Jesus and helped support his ministry. We are told that Jesus actually delivered seven demons from her. We have that passage in Luke chapter 8 verse 2. This is the same Mary. So her deliverance, the life change that Jesus brought in her life was something wonderful that she experienced in her life. And there's the passage. Whatever her past may have been, Jesus delivered her from it. And that's the Jesus that's here with us today. Whatever our past was, and whatever our past is, and whatever our present is, whatever situation you may find yourself in right now, Jesus is here to meet you right where you're at. She found life again, a life centered on Jesus. And now suddenly, tragically, that life is all mixed up. Notice how she speaks of him. She doesn't say, where have they taken his, where have they taken his body? No. She says, they've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've put him. You see, gee, there's, a, there, there's a sense of intimacy that we read there. They've taken away my Lord. There was a personal relationship that she had with Jesus. Jesus was her teacher. Jesus was her savior. He was the one who had given her her life back. She received meaning in life as she encountered Jesus. And perhaps some of you this morning are looking for meaning in your life. And you can relate to Mary because Jesus gave her that. And perhaps some of us have got to the place where, where Jesus seems a far distance from us. And after years of torment, she began to dream again because she, as she was following Jesus. Perhaps she began to dream of good things for herself. She began to dream of good things for her people. All this was running through her mind. But life had killed her dream. The Roman cross had seen to that. Her dream was shattered lying in a heap. What was she to do? What must I do now? I guess we have questions like that in our lives sometimes. What are we to do when our dreams are shattered? What future was there for her now? What future is there for her without Jesus, without her Savior? Perhaps we're asking the same in our lives. What future is there for me? I don't know what the future holds. And to be a little cliche, but I know Jesus holds it. She may as well have said, they've taken away my hope. My hope is gone. Everything that I thought is gone. We ask ourselves, well, what is hope? What is hope? Is it wishful thinking? Is it naive optimism? We say stuff like, I hope it doesn't rain today because I want to have a round of golf. I hope the economy bounces back because, man, I've lost a lot on the market. I hope the sermon this morning is not too long. <laughs> the dictionary defines hope like this. Hope is a desire with the expectation of fulfillment. Isn't that amazing? with the expectation of a fulfillment. So hope begins with a desire for something good and then adds the element of expectation. But it's more than that. It also adds confidence. That we have a confident hope 
because of who Jesus is. You see, without expectation, hope is just wishful thinking. And most times, wishes don't come true. Isn't that a fact? We wish and we wish and we wish just to find out that nothing actually happens. But when we hope for something, we're counting on it. And when we hope in Jesus, we are counting on the fact that He is alive and that He loves us. You see, hope to the Spirit is what is oxygen to the body. Without it, we will die. Each of us need hope in our lives. And if we fail to have hope, we will perish. Because there's only one person that you and I can place our hope in, and that is in the person of Jesus Christ. It's almost like when a team loses hope, the game is over. It's hopeless. When investors lose hope in the market, it tumbles. When a patient loses hope, death seems to be crouching at the door. We have to have hope. We have this, and our hope is in Jesus. It's not just an empty hope. It's hope not in hope, but it's in hope in a person, in a whom. Viktor Frankl survived years in the Nazi concentration camps, and he noticed that the prisoners died, most prisoners, a lot of the prisoners died just after Christmas. They were hoping that they'd be free by then, and when they weren't freed, they simply gave up. He learned that as long as prisoners had something to live for and had a reason to press on, that they could endure just about anything. But once they had lost hope, they quickly perished. You see, hope does something in us. It keeps us going. It keeps us alive. And it's the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And that's what sustains us. Mary had no reason for hope that morning. Jesus was gone. And, and there was an emptiness about her. There was maybe the wishful thinking, but that didn't help. There was no naive optimism. Jesus wasn't there. I mean, she was a witness. She saw Jesus die on the cross. She was there. His body was laid in the tomb. She came that morning early with the spices to anoint the Lord's body. Remember that she'd already been to the tomb early that morning. She came at the crack of dawn as the sun was coming up. And she heard the angel say that he's risen, and that he's risen indeed. And yet she still doubted in her life. She just wasn't buying it. How could he be alive? She watched him die. She saw him lay to rest. She saw him bleed. She saw the spear pierce his side. As far as what she was concerned, it was over. There was no more hope. The empty tomb didn't speak to her of the resurrection. Not by a long shot. It spoke to her of a lost hope. It spoke to her of negativity. And so she did what all people would do at a grave. Just wept. Just wept and wept. Mary had no reason for hope that morning. And yet the Bible, as John pens it, until, until someone was standing there with her. She didn't recognize him at first, and, and so much speculation. is Maybe she was crying so much that her eyes were blurry and she didn't see it too good. Maybe it was still dim light because of the earliness of the morning. But most likely it was the fact that Jesus' appearance had changed, that his body had changed. There was something different about him. And then she hears Jesus say, Woman, why are you crying? There's that question again. The angel that asked Mary, why are you crying? And here Jesus asked, Mary, why are you crying? Mary stays in that moment and Jesus meets her there in that hopeless state. And that's what Jesus does for you and I. He comes alongside of us and he meets us in that hopeless state. When all, all hope seems shattered, when everything is futile, Jesus shows up. There's a lesson that we can learn from that is that when people are in a desperate situation, we don't need to come to them with lectures. We don't need to come to them with cliches. We don't rush to the good news by pouncing on people and say, hey, it's going to be okay. Jesus didn't say to Mary, ta-da, here I am. He didn't do that. He just quietly came and stood by her. He doesn't say to Mary, stop crying, it's all going to be okay. He didn't say that. And he certainly didn't scold her for a lack of faith. Just believe, you probably have doubt in your life. 
And when someone is hurting or grieving and discouraged, they don't need happy talk. But we need someone to come there and stand alongside of us. They certainly don't need the religious cliches that we so often bring at desperate times. We say things like everything happens for a reason. Or they're in a better place. Or we might say, well, what doesn't kill you makes you strong. In fact, just recently Kelly Clarkson came out with the lyrics of that song. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You've probably heard it on the radio. But there's a futility in that. Grief is real. Loss is painful. Unemployment does stink. It's lousy. And relationships can break one's heart. And if someone in your world is hurting, and if you want to share that hope that Jesus Christ has given you, come alongside them. And the best thing sometimes to do is just be there for them. Just come and meet them where they are. Ask them to tell you about it. And then sit still long enough to listen. In other words, be compassionate, be caring. Hope comes from evidence and experience. And so Mary gained that hope. And that's exactly what Jesus did for Mary. When she was ready, Jesus gently came to her, personally reveals himself to her. In John chapter 20, verse 16, he just simply says her name, Mary. And she recognized it. And something twin, there was that, there's something about the Lord's voice that spoke to her deep down inside her heart. There was something about that sound. Something about the mention of her name that opened her eyes and opened her heart to the love and compassion of Jesus. It was Him. Suddenly, her life changed and suddenly there was now reason to believe. There He was. Hope again. Hope had again risen and taken a hold of her heart and she became encouraged. You could almost see the crying cease as she embraced the Master. And Jesus said, please don't touch me yet. I haven't yet ascended. He wasn't yet glorified. But she needed something more than just head knowledge about Jesus. She needed that real encounter with Jesus, as so many of us do. We need to experience Jesus firsthand and not just know the fact, yes, there is a resurrection. But have we encountered the risen one that we celebrate in the resurrection? We need the same thing that Mary did. We need to encounter and experience Jesus in a personal way. And those of us who struggle with the resurrection, we struggle with the fact maybe, well, what evidence is there? The evidence is, as we find in the Scriptures and, and throughout the writings of history, there is an empty tomb. There are written records both in secular writings as well as in biblical writings. There's the transformation that occurred in the disciples' lives after they encountered Jesus after the resurrection. There was a transformation and there was the emergence of this new faith called Christianity that swept across the world. People died for their faith. Then people still today are dying for something real that is life-changing, life-impacting, and gives a person hope beyond this existence. There is the evidence of changed lives. When you encounter Jesus or you know someone who has, there's a marked change of a person that is in love with Jesus Christ and suddenly falls in love with Him prior to them not knowing Christ. We need something personally. We need something experiential. Each one of us do. We need to experience Jesus just like Mary did that day. Jesus was not only there for her, and He came and He proved Himself to her. He proved to her that He was stronger than death, much stronger than death. He was stronger than evil. He was stronger than all the bad things that could ever happen in the world. He came and he proved that to her as he was encountering her. And this is what, Je this is what Jesus offered Mary at the tomb is the same thing that Jesus Christ comes and offers to you and I today. We have hope. Jesus said to her, go tell my brothers, tell the world, death is defeated. I am risen. Go tell them that he's alive. Guess what? That's exactly what she did. She went back and told them. You see, hope is not a what or a when or a why. Hope is in a whom. And our hope is in the whom named Jesus Christ. 
the risen Savior. Hope is always embodied in a person. Shareholders who are in the market there, their hope is in the new CEO. Maybe that he can come and turn around the company and turn it around from to produce a profit rather than a downslide. Citizens hope for a new leader that their country can get back on track. Someone wise enough, someone strong enough, someone good enough to get us to a better place. That's what hope is. And that is who Jesus Christ is. He will come and take us to a better place. His resurrection proves that He is stronger. His resurrection proves that He is stronger than any setback. He's stronger than any failure. He's stronger than any loss. He's stronger than any disappointment. This is who Jesus is. This is the hope that we have in Him. And if life has a way of killing dreams, Jesus is the way to bring them back to life again. He's the only way. And so whatever dream you have, don't let it fall smashed on the ground. Let Jesus pick it up and restore your vision. Let Him restore your dream. Let Him restore the hope that He has because He loves you desperately. So much so that He went to Calvary. And on that third day that we celebrate today, He arose from the dead. That's not to say that we always get what we want. That's, that's true. But the thing is, and what you and I have to realize, that there is no magic in following Jesus, but there's an assurance that we gain in following Him. Life doesn't work in a magical way, because that's just hocus pocus. But God can and will do something good with your future if you really trust Him. You and I must trust Him. You and I must come to that place where our hope is in, who, is in Him. And that's why hope is. What is hope? The confidence that God can and will do something good in this life and in the life to come. So whatever circumstance that you may be facing today, whatever circumstance you're in this morning, whatever pain, whatever loss, whatever disappointment that you might be dealing with right at this very moment, this injunction in time, God can do something good with it and in it if we trust Him. So we don't see the whole picture, but God does. And it doesn't minimize the pain or the evil that we encounter every day because that's reality. But it tells us that the story is not over. The hope that we have in Jesus Christ, as in Mary's case, the story wasn't over yet. God can and still will meet you in the place. God is strong enough and wise enough to do something good, to do something meaningful, to do something eternally significant in your life, in our life, and in our life in a, as a community. In this life, we can find joy. We can find beauty. We can find healing forgiveness. We can find purpose, restoration, and the reality of God's presence in our lives every single day of our existence. God can be there if we just trust Him, if we have our hope in Him. In the life to come, we can look forward to our reunion with those who have gone before us. We can hope, and our hope is sure, of the restoration of all creation and to the eternal life with God and with one another in the world to come. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes these words, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has ever imagined what God has prepared for those that love Him. We can't even begin to fathom what God has for us. It is so amazing and so overwhelming. Hope isn't just wishful thinking. It's confident living, facing the future, knowing that God can and will do something good in this life as well as in the life to come. It's confidence. It's not emptiness. It's not being naive. Let's just go back to the story that we began with. We left poor Fantine dying there on the street.